Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. As we all turn there now and give attention to God's word, let us all rise in reverence and respect. Once again, our assigned reading is Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. People of God, there is a reading of God's word that is given you. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. Uh, Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, and, uh, Moses Aaron, and Hur went, up to the, uh, went on top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until going down with the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with a sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in the book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This reading of God's word. Will you be seated? Will you pray for us? We'll dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would uh, give us ears to hear and that you would make our hearts uh, receptive to your word. Uh, that it would change us, transform us to be more like Christ. That we would trust in him, that we would depend on him. And indeed, Father, that we would walk in this life with much strength and courage under his banner. We thank you for your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today is September 11. Uh, for you guys who are old enough, you know that this day, 15 years ago, was a day that cannot be forgotten. Uh, September 11, 2001. Where were you guys in 2001? <laughs> Maybe not even born yet. <laughs> I was in my friend's bedroom. It was the day of our freshman orientation for UW. You know, we turn on the TV and we see uh, the first tower uh, being hit by a plane. And uh, we saw live the second plane. Hit tower two. After those events, war broke out. War seems to be a very common thing in our day. But beloved, It is far more common than we give it credit. Because as Christians, we are at war every day of our life. Israel's journey to the Promised Land proved to be very difficult. All the various ordeals, however, was also not without purpose. We all know that the wilderness was testing grounds for Israel's faith or the lack thereof and that God was preparing Israel to be that people who would be worthy to inherit the land that he promised to them. The land of Canaan. The land that God reserved to be their inheritance. We see that the wilderness that Israel would experience was not without purpose. 
But we see this morning that the wilderness is not the only thing that Israel will encounter in their pilgrimage. But alongside wilderness, there is another type of trial, there is another type of ordeal that awaits them, that is introduced to them. And that will be a common theme for them now as they prepare to win Canaan as their land. Of course, this trial and ordeal is one of warfare. Warfare. Beloved, just as it is naive for any Christian to assume that their life after being a Christian would be one filled with prosperity and earthly blessings, Yes, naive for us to think that, for us not to expect any wilderness, any testing, any working of sanctification in our life. Beloved, it is equally naive for us to think that in this life we will go through without any opposition, that we will go through without any type of attack. On our faith. Just as Israel, on the cusp of their entrance, was met by God's enemies. Beloved, as Christians who are on the cusp of entering into our eternal promised land that Christ has promised for us, we better be sure and better be ready. Because Satan, Satan, is ready to attack. Just as Amalek and the Amalekites were had a purpose to prevent, to paralyze, and to prevail over Israel, Satan, in this life, Though his head is crushed, he is not going to go down without swinging at the church. And he's going to seek to prevent, to paralyze, and to prevail over anyone that he can possibly prevail over before Christ returns in judgment. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, language of warfare, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, that is, in the invisible places. Beloved, we are, as Christians, engaging in warfare. It is unseen. But I think a lot of us, because it is not seen, we think lightly upon it. Because the war, beloved, is within upon our affections, upon our conscience, upon our will, because that threat is not visible, we, we don't feel the necessity to arm ourselves, to be ready, to be sensitive, to be weary, of all that happens within. Israel's threat was visible. It was a visible enemy. They fought with real weapons, an actual sword. But beloved, the war that wages now within us and the enemy that looks to prevail over us is one that is far greater 
than any of the enemies Israel will ever meet in her conquest, in her campaign for Canaan. It is a spiritual battle. It is invisible. But this one will have eternal consequences. Because what Satan will prevent us from entering is not an earthly land, but it is the land that God deems as the new heavens and the new earth, our eternal abode. How can we be prepared for this war? First, we must know how the enemy attacks. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, we have a deeper, uh, a more detailed uh, look at how Amalek and the Amalekites attacked Israel. Uh, we're told that the Amalekites came to Israel, but in Deuteronomy 9, we just see how the nature of is, uh, Amalek attacking Israel really looks like. And it was from behind. It was from behind where they least expected. And it was from behind where all the animals, where all the women, and where all the children were. Surely, the Amalekites whose commanding officer is Satan, Satan would attack in the same manner. He's going to come at you when you least expect it. And he's going to come at you in the areas of your life that is most weak and vulnerable. That is why Paul refers to this as a wrestle, as a struggle, as a strife. It is difficult. But not only should we be aware of how the enemy attacks, but where the enemy will attack us, that we will be better ready to prevent and to persevere when that warfare does happen. Spiritual warfare, beloved, listen, happens in three arenas of the Christian life. Three arenas in the Christian life. First, it is the arena of the heart. The arena of the heart. Second, it is the arena of the mind. Of the mind. And third, it is the arena of the will. Of the heart, of the mind, and of the will. The first arena of spiritual warfare occurs in the heart. This I'll refer to as the arena of affection. It is our affection that gives, that gives the motivation, that steers us in the direction, in the desires that we have, and the decisions that we make. And the reason why Satan seeks to attack the heart, the source of our affection, is because that is where the affection for Christ lies. And so he will deceive us to love other things, to love other people more than Jesus. When we desire to do that which is not honoring to God, that which is not pleasing to Christ, and that which does not exalt Jesus in our life, when we find ourselves desiring to do these things, even before we decide to do it, when we see ourselves desiring, being lured to, being convinced to do these things, beloved, you can be sure that the war is happening in your heart and upon your affections. And therefore we must learn to keep our wants and our needs in check. Just because you want something doesn't mean it's good for you. And just because you want something doesn't necessarily mean you need it. And just because you want something, and this is the most important one, just because you want something certainly does not make it permissible. We must learn to keep our wants in check. 
in the 21st century with postmodernism that tells you that your want is king and that you should operate autonomously and that you yourself is a law unto yourself and therefore everything you want, anything you want is permissible and just because you want it justifies the decisions that you made to have it. For the sake of convenience in the 21st century, we have, we have, ignored our moral obligations. For the sake of con convenience takes precedence over our moral obligation. Because we are often ruled by our wants and the world tells us to act according to your want. Beloved, if you want to, if you want to see a consequence of how, of how uh, uh, deep of a lie this really is, if you, if you just look at the 21st century, just the 21st century itself, you'd be surprised that in the 21st century that we have killed more people in the entire world than all the 20 previous 20 centuries combined. This is what happens when you allow your wants to rule over you. It ignores the fact that the human heart by nature is selfish, is broken, and is dead in sin. The default mode of the heart and the affection, if it is not ruled by Christ, but ruled by our wants, we will default to doing things, loving things, and desiring things that God hates. And Satan will take that, and he'll go to town with it. He'll go to town on you. He'll leave you bruised in black and blue. Beloved, be suspicious. Whenever you find yourself wanting to do something, be weary of it. Be skeptical of it. Be suspicious of it. For that is the only way when we begin to examine ourselves according to the word of God and not according to the world. The first arena where Satan will attack is your heart. Because if you first if, if you fail here, you fail everywhere. If you love something more than God, then, then, then it is easy pickings. Check your wants. Check your wants. There's a lot of things you want to do in this life. And a lot of the things that we want to do are not influenced by what God wants us to do. But it's influenced by the way other people who don't know God live in this world. The second arena of the spiritual battle occurs in the mind. This I'll refer to as the arena of reason and intellect. Not only the affection but the battle wages in the mind. Where we not only have now in our hearts the desire to do something, but we find ourselves giving ourselves reasons why it will be okay for us to do what we want to do. Even though we know it's wrong, do we not find ourselves giving ourselves reasons 
why it will be okay to justify the sin. That it will be okay for us to go through with what we want to do, even though we know that is not what we should do. And so when you not only see yourselves now desiring something, but that desire has, has migrated over to you deciding to do it, that war has moved from your heart to your mind. And beloved, that does not happen in a season, a time, or a day at a time, but it is instantaneous. The Apostle Paul says in Romans again, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Is your mind conformed to the word of God? In, your, in the words of the reformer Martin Luther, is your mind held captive? Is your conscience held captive to the word of God? Because I can tell you this. No discipline, no area or arena of discipline and study in this world will teach you and help you to become a better Christian. No people outside the church is going to help you and teach you and encourage you to be a better Christian. Philosophy, forget about it. That's not going to help you to be a better Christian, a more godly person. And so, of course, when we give our mind to what the world teaches and what the world believes, and when we get to conform our minds according to the principles and the philosophies of this world, of course we will give way and give in to the devil's schemes. They will not help you overcome when you are overwhelmed by Satan's attacks. Oh, I'll be fine. Uh, I, I, you know what? I, I have something called self-control. So I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Yeah, self-control is a, is a godly virtue. But is your self-control conform according to the Word of God? We've all used a filter before. We've all used a filter before. You know how filters work. And it is an instrument that is used to separate what is good from what is bad, simply put. Right? A filter does the job of of discerning, as it were, what is useful from that which is garbage and needs to be dis, uh, uh, discarded or destroyed. Beloved, the Word of God, the more you read and the more you grow in God's Word, your filter through which you discern what is good and what God desires for you. And that which needs to be discarded. And yes, even destroyed. Grows all the more finer. And finer. And finer. It seems like a lot of us just succumb to this war. When I look, and not just at my generation, 
but the generation after our parents, where we are a generation where we have every access to the Bible on our iPhone, on our Android phones, everywhere. We can project it up here so easily. We have it so easily accessible, but our generation is a generation that does not read the Bible. And we wonder why our generation is the most unchurched, the most unchristian, the most Christless generation. We have discarded the filter altogether and we just let the world pour into our life as it will. The Word of God is not only your hope and the power unto your salvation, but it is the rule by which we are to live that God will be pleased and that we in this life, as well as the next, will be filled with great joy. The third arena of warfare is upon the will. This I will refer to as the arena of operations. This is where Satan lies to you. This is where Satan will lie to you. And I think all of us, all of us have been here. Satan will lie to you if you if you desired it, and if you decided to do it, then you know what? You just might as well do it. You just might as well do it. And we fall into that lie and we become in a ways convinced distressed at the same time. Yeah, you know what? I did feel it. I did want to do it. And I did convince myself that I should do it. Why don't I just do it? It's pretty much as good as done. Might as well just do it. No. Yes, Jesus said in the Sermon of the Mount that if we hate our brothers in our heart, and if we lust after another in our heart, then we have already committed the sin of murder and adultery. But we have to keep this in mind that Jesus was also speaking to a crowd that was largely comprised of Pharisees, who were convinced that they were sinless just because they did not act upon the intents of their heart. But beloved, just because the intent of our heart is this way, and because just because we are guilty of that intent, does not mean that we ought to fully see to it that this sin becomes realized. It is never too late. It is never too late for us to turn to Christ in repentance for restoration. That is the truth. Satan will lie to you. You thought it. You wanted to do it. Might as well do it. But the truth is, it is never too late. You don't have to go through it. It is never too late for you to turn to Christ in repentance and for restoration. Satan will seek to bind your will that God has freed to obedience. But no, that you don't have to follow through. Don't fall under that deception. For you just follow through. What must we do? Now that we know where our enemy will attack, upon the heart, upon the mind, and upon
upon the will, what must we do? What did Moses do when Israel was attacked by the Amalekites? One, he prayed. Two, he remembered. One, he prayed. Beloved, I encourage you that we must pray. Because prayer is an act of trust and dependence upon the Lord. Moses knew. And you gotta remember, this is the first for many for Israel, and the first for many for Moses. This is the first time they're attacked by their enemies from the outside. This is the first time they have to bear arms. This is the first time they have to bear a shield. This is the first time that they have to march out. This is the first time that they had to get information. This is the first time that they had to take commands from Joshua. This is the first for many. So you can imagine how anxious, worried, and fearful Israel and Moses must have been. But what does Moses do? He does what the only thing he can do, and that is trust and depend on the Lord provide for them the victory that they needed. And what does God do? God provides for them the victory that they needed. We must pray. We must pray. And we must remember. After Israel defeated the Amalekites, Moses built an altar and named that altar Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is our banner. The Lord is our standard. The Lord is our identity, our savior, our strength, and our courage. And so if, if we should forget anything that I said this morning, this one we ought to remember and that is to remember. This banner that Moses establishes will be the sign for Israel to look to. This is the first battle of many battles Israel will engage in. And it will be a sign for them that just like the first, Every other battle that they will now engage in, the victory, their victory, will come from the Lord. And so, beloved, we too, as Christians in this world, who are engaged in a spiritual warfare, where our enemy seeks to prevail, prevent, and paralyze us from entering our eternal inheritance, we must remember this, that we too have a banner that we too have a banner that flies and that is waved over us. And this banner is a banner that the prophet Isaiah spoke of in Isaiah chapter 11. The root of Jesse will stand as a banner for his people. The nations will rally to him and his place will be rest, uh, will be of rest and will be glorious. And of course, this banner for you and me, this banner that is the symbol and sign of God's victory over our enemy, the symbol and the sign of God's victory over sin and death and Satan is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when we remember, when we remember Christ's victory over death, and we remember, when we remember Christ's victory over Satan, and when He becomes our strength, and when He is our courage, and when He is our banner, beloved, just as Israel under their banner marched safely into the land that they would inherit, under Christ, and under the banner of His cross, and under the banner of His blood, and under the banner of His resurrection, you will then enter into the eternal rest that God promised to you. Look to the cross. Yahweh Nisi. Look to Jesus, our eternal banner. Amen.
there's no better way to end than with the words of our Lord Jesus who proclaimed the Son of Man must be lifted up. The Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in Him Yes, sir.